Um, you give you give the model that attacked Minico uh, karmic the karmic fate upgrade, and that just says whenever well, I think it says uh, whenever Minico would take damage, the model with the upgrade also takes the same amount of damage. Oh, nice! Uh, Howdy, friends! Boy, we got a treat for you. This um, Asami Deep Dive has some incredible insights from two very top players, and I'll tell you, if you even if you don't play Asami, you are going to learn something from this episode. Cover a lot of things. We discover what a flexible master she is. Um, we're going to learn when summoning may not be the best move. Uh, you'll be a little bit surprised with the first model they hire after the totem. Their take on flicker bombing might surprise you. Uh, Greg makes an argument for using Terracotta Warriors in an Oni crew, and I know a lot of people don't think Terracotta Warriors. Um, um, really have found a home yet. They both um, have their main builds, but they both have some very interesting alternate builds that we really dig into. Um, at the very end, we talk about Shen Long and uh, all the chatter around uh, that master and how uh, people that ran him performed at UK Nationals. That's definitely worth sticking around for. Uh, last but not least, you may have noticed that I've started leaving outtakes at the very end of each episode. Um, so let me know in the comments on Facebook if you uh, like uh, having those there. Enjoy. strategy game allows you to unplug and test your skills against friends. Every week, Third Floor Wars delivers useful strategies, discussions, battle reports, and reviews to tabletop games like Malifaux. If you want to get better at the games you already play or discover the games other people are playing, you are in the right place. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk broadcast. Craig here on the third floor. Today we're going to do a deep dive into the Ten Thunders Master Asami Tanaka and how the Oni crew works in Malifaux 3rd Edition. My guests today are Alex Drake and Greg Pakash. Anyone that has heard our McCabe deep dive already knows Alex, and he recently finished fourth at the UK Nationals event. So, Alex, welcome back to the third floor. Yeah, thank you for having me, Craig. It's, uh, it's great to be here again. So, can you give me kind of a couple sentences on uh, how the UK Nationals felt? Oh, yeah, it's um, wonderful. Be- best event of the year, uh, some would say. Yeah, Se- Seven games, seven great opponents. Um 86 people, I think we had this time. It's amazing. No, really, yeah, really, really good. Just to see that many tables in a hall and that many people playing a game is, is uh, it's really inspiring. So. Yeah, I bet. So you guys on the first day play four games, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I like when I when I'm playing in a grand tournament or even a regular tournament after the end of round three, like my brain is fried. Uh, how do you put together enough to get uh, uh, like clear thinking for a fourth game? Uh, I, I think clear thinking goes out the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, on, on, on the Saturday, we did we did three games in a row, uh, the, the last three games. So by by the fourth game, you just you just sort of trying to go on autopilot, really. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an enjoyment spot at that at that, at that point. It, it really is because I mean it's just so mentally exhausting. Yeah, you, you, you get into it actually though, and sometimes you know by the end of the, the end of the day, you're sort of like, yeah, well, let's play again. Where's my fifth game? <laughs> <laughs> That's when the adrenaline kicks in. Yeah, let's take, let's take it to the pub. Let's let's play another game. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, so uh, my next, my other guest is Greg, and this is actually his first appearance on the podcast. But many of you probably already know his name. Um, he held the top spot during uh, M2E in the UK rankings for uh, t- over twelve straight months, which is which is impressive. Uh, he took a short break from Alpha, but he's back for this new edition. And uh, some of you might recognize him because he did the Lilith ma- Master Spotlight on Schemes and Stones uh, back in M2E. So, Greg, welcome to the third floor, man. Hey, thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me. It's uh, yeah, a little bit um, weird to be back, but we've got a we've got a really good game to play. So, so I now having left and come back and um, having uh, you know a couple months now. What is uh, what's your feelings about third edition versus second? Oh, I love it. Um, I love it. It is. It's it's weird how streamlined the game feels considering. Um, there's nothing being taken out of it from a, a model point of view, which I know it's not exactly true because of Dead Man's Hand and things yeah. like that. 
But when you consider how many models are in Deadsman hand compared to how many we've got left, um, the fact that you're playing a game that just seems to work so much better, and and second was 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 still a superb game. Um, I mean, I've, I'm coming from from all the way from from 1.5, and when we um, initially made a transition to yeah. to second, um, we only played with half a game for over a year. Um, masters like um, wow. well, Jack Doyle no wasn't a master, but I suppose we didn't have uh, no Molly, for example, no Colette, no Dreamer. Um, masters like that d- didn't exist. Um, well, they did, but they had no no second edition rules. And so, yeah, our, f- our first game was uh, our first year was played right. with only maybe three masters of faction, I think, if I remember correctly, um, including kind of a ten thunders once. So yeah, that's crazy. This is a uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. I know what you're saying, though. Yeah, and I know what you're saying about it. it's 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 funny how streamlined it feels because like the first time you I read the three uh, uh, third edition rules, I was like, okay, there's some nice little tweaks here, nice little tweaks there. But until I actually started playing, I didn't realize what a huge impact it had on how the game felt. Yeah, absolutely massive, um, and a lot of a lot of things, even just that the. the, the um, it sounds such a simple thing, but we have the same effect. We'll have the same name or the same ability, even whether it's on a Neverborn card or an Outcast card, yep. and just little things like that. Again, especially if you're a newer player coming into the game, where it's like, oh, you know, I've got, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a word not disguised. Though that was a bad example, but um, because it was the same in, in M2E, mm-hmm. no matter who you were. But at least then you you know what that ability does, and like, oh, you, you play another crew that you've never played before. And he said, oh, well, this person's got X, Y, Z ability. Like, oh, well, okay, I know what two of those do already. Right, excellent. That's, you know, what's the third? Um, exactly. Yeah, just li- little things, but but it adds up to a lot. Yeah, it makes a big it makes a big difference. No, I completely agree. So, guys, what I want to do is I want to focus on, obviously, Asami and, what the, and the Oni crew. And I want to really get a sense of how you guys build an Oni crew, how the crew plays, um, if there's any T... Uh, tech pieces uh, in the crew that you bring in based off of, you know, the strategy or certain schemes. Um, and we also want to cover how to counter this crew. Um, so, Alex, um, let's pretend that pe- somebody listening right now has never played Asami, never played against Asami, hasn't even read the card. Can you kind of give us an overview of the style of master that Asami is? Yeah, so um, she's a really, really flexible summoning master, um, able to to summoning uh, summon in only to sort of fit the uh, the situation at the time. So she can summon in quite sort of aggressive big beaters or sort of like scheming or support pieces. And she does that to fit the situation and fit what sort of like your opponent's doing to sort of either put pressure on them or to answer what they're doing. So flexible summoner. Yeah, flexible flexible summoner. Some I think some would say like aggressive summoner uh, with some of the positioning and, and, and with the flicker mechanic that I'm sure we'll get into. But yeah, maybe aggressive, flexible summoner. I think is is how I how I class her. Um, yeah, to someone someone that's never heard of her, or is, or is sort of like coming to her sort of afresh. Yeah, um, just to, to to add to what to what Alex said, that she's she's a phenomenally um, flexible summoner, um, but due to kind of the nature of her keyword and how her summons work, which we'll we'll get into in a bit, um, she also has to then effectively support her models, which is where I think a lot of the kind of aggressive summoner thing comes from. Um, is that she she needs to be close to her models um, for her summons to be effective um, in, in a fairly roundabout way, um, which again, uh, is a little bit of foreshadowing, but we'll, we'll get into. Um, it's not so much that she herself summons and then is aggressive, it's that she needs to play forward to continually support her summoned models. Um, it's not kind of a um, not exactly a fire and forget type of mechanic. Um, there's a lot of additional um, aftercare, right, right, and, and so which is going to bring her up, right, um, and, and, and in order to do that support. So, Greg, let's jump right into that though. So, because her her summoning is very unique, and this flicker mechanic is very unique. Do you mind walking through um, kind of how she summons and w- what flicker means? Yeah, certainly. Um, so. It's, so in terms of how she summons, um, Asami has this um, beautiful ability to summon without any form of resource. Um, she doesn't need any markers down. All you need is a mask um, card of a high enough value, depending on, on what you wish to summon. Um, now, the uh, downside of that, or oh, I suppose yeah, the, way, the way it's kind of balanced around is that um, 
like many other summoners, she gives her models an upgrade when it summons. Um, and part of the text on that upgrade states that when a model summoned, it gains two flicker tokens, uh, which we'll get to in a second. And when um, that model, uh, at the end of that model's activation, it gains uh, another flicker token. Um, now, flicker herself, that's um, part of her keyword. I think the actual keyword itself uh, ability is called From Beyond. Um, but flicker is is what you as, as an Asami player or Asami opponent will interact with. Um, and so basically what this says is uh, before you perform a duel, you can give a model a flicker token. Um, and that flicker token basically works like focus. Uh, you gain a positive to the flip of a duel and you gain a positive to any resulting damage flip. Um, now, if you, um, at the end of uh, any model's activation, so your own friendly enemy, whatever, um, if you have, or a model has three or more flicker tokens on it, um, and then it is uh, killed, it disappears. Um, Got it. The whole kind of flicker mechanic um, is, it's, it's. I'm not sure if um, I'm going to explain this correctly, but there's this kind of Japanese um, saying um, called mono no ware, which I've probably butchered the the pronunciation of, but that basically is, is like a, um, a a sensitivity or an appreciation of um, impermeance. Um, which is a lot of what her crew's about. Um, I think in, in I suppose in, in English, the closest thing we might have is like the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Nice. Um, so you, we do, you, you know, the flicker mechanic lets you accelerate, but you won't be around that long. Um, and going back to her summoning upgrades, when you summon in, um, you know, you automatically gain two flicker. At the end of that model's activation, it's going to get a third, uh, which means it's only going to last one turn as opposed to other summoners where, you know, a model you summon on turn one could easily be around in, you know, turn four or five. Um, right. Unless, um, again, we, we, we got some like aftercare we talked about, uh, which I might let Alex talk about um, instead. You, you're you only going to have your summon model around for, for the one turn. But there's obviously ways, and we're going to get into it, that you can mitigate that, I would assume. So, Alex, um, you know, I would imagine, you know, part of the art – of running this crew is really being able to manage that flicker, right? Yeah, managing your flicker is is, is huge. Actually, it's it's really where you're going to squeeze out uh, the, the best of, of of the crew. You know, you can be because you can just simply uh, summon a summon an oni, summon a demon, put it down, um, and you know it's only going to last one activation. It, it's not slow. It's not stunned. It, it just goes in, and you gain the flicker to get focuses on its attacks, and you can have sort of a really like like uh, like Greg said, a really bright brightly burning summon. Um, but then but then your other options are maybe trying to keep it around an extra turn. Do I um, do I summon it um, and I get to place it next to some scrap or um, corpse markers? Uh, so when when you summon it and it's within a, an inch of scrap or corpse, you can remove each one to lessen the flicker that it's gained upon. Um, do I try and use some of her other abilities to 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 reduce the, the flicker after it's summoned? Um, uh, you know, to sort of try and keep that that that, that model uh, alive for for longer, and I, th- I think that really is the the balance that you're looking at when you're playing the crew. You know, you, you you're going in hard, or you're trying to uh, keep them alive for longer, and and, and that's that, that's what I find I find that really really interesting. Um, I think so. The the main way she's managing the the, the flicker is probably with um, a mother's love, which is a um, it's a tactical action. Um, Range eight, so that's where she needs to be a little bit up the board in range of those summons and in range of her crew. Um, she needs a, a four, a four to cast it. Um, targets an only, and it discards a flicker from them and gives them focus. So you could sort of see this as maybe giving them two, two focuses, uh, sure. or two APs worth, you know, sort of. But you're removing the flicker to keep them alive, and then you're giving them a focus for a, a, a further action. Um, and I'll often be um, using this on my on my models just to keep them below that, um, to actually to keep them keep them down to one flicker, maybe so that they survive maybe the next turn or depending on the situation. But that's that's the decision you, you're making. Uh, the other way she manages the flicker is um, when a uh, when a mod when a friendly only ends its activation within ten of her, um, she can suffer two damage um, to um, remove a flicker token from that model. So. If your opponent's sort of thinking that it's going to die at the end of its activation, um, and then Asami will take two damage to to remove it and keep it alive, and that can be a bit of a, um, a key a key way of keeping your models on the board. But you can't overuse it because yeah, 
It's the life of your master. She's she's also got a trigger on her summon. Um, so it's on a, on a, on a crow. So if, if you are summoning, you know, you're know you going to need a mask and, and a crow for it. So you're stoning for one of them and having the card for the other. And that's that she could suffer any amount of damage and reduce the flicker on the summon model by the amount of damage she suffers. So, you know, you can use a 13 of masks. You can stone for the crow. You can summon a Jaragumo. Um, she could take two wounds and it comes into play on no flicker. Um, which, you know, which is, uh, impactful because then it can have two, you know, it can have a, a couple, a focused attack, uh, on its turn and not, not have to worry about disappearing. But, but I mean, boy, you got to be smart about all of that, don't you? I mean, there's a lot to balance there, which is not putting too much damage on her because she's not going to be hiding, you know, in the back of your deployment zone while this is all yeah. happening. And two, um, you know, deciding whether, you know, that corpse and scrap markers in the right place where you need the model to be, or do you need to summon it somewhere else that it's not going to have that? I mean, Greg, that, that seems like uh, a lot of finesse. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's it's one of, one of my kind of, I suppose, key tenants um, that I've developed when playing it is that, yeah, you, you need to plan at least one turn ahead. Um, because you've got, as you said, you've got Flicker to manage, you have uh, Sammy's wounds to manage, uh, you have the different ways of, and then the different ways of managing those, whether it's a Sammy's abilities, you know, picking up um, scrap markers from the summon. Um, a Sammy can also use um, scrap scheme and, and course markers to heal herself. Um, so you're kind of juggling her wounds, you're juggling flicker, you're using different resources to, to manage the flicker and manage um, her wounds. Um, it's worth saying as well um, that the actual Oni models themselves, um, when they kill an enemy model, they can also remove a flicker from themselves. So you've kind of got that uh, risk analysis. You know, when you've got a model on two flicker, it's do you spend for the third um, to go in for the kill, hoping that you could right. then take another flicker off. Um, if that model dies, there, there's there's a lot um, going on in, inside that keyword. It's one of the reasons I, um, I adore it so much. Um, no matter what game the... Well, no matter how the game's going, for you it's interesting, right? Because there's all this other right. little th- bits and pieces going on in the background. Yeah, I mean, it's def- definitely not a you know a plug and play master. I mean, that is obvious. Um, and depending, I would imagine the kind of player you are, that's what can make her attractive because the, the flexibility she brings is huge. Um, but you can't. Um, I mean, you just got a you got a lot to think about, and, that, and that's like I said, that's okay. Um, it. Um, I, I, she's she's one of the several Ten Thunders Masters that uh, I find incredibly interesting. So, Greg, my next question about that, though, is so we're playing her forward. We're really doing our best to, to manage how much damage she's taking to try to keep her stuff standing. Um, is there other things that are keeping her on the board? Is there any defensive tech she has? Is there any healing she's getting? I mean, what, what prevents her from going from 12 to no wounds in two turns? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of defensive tech, um, she's base defense six, which is, you know, already pretty nice. decent, um, already up there. Um, she could also, um, and I'm going to forget the name. Um, she can pass off attacks, uh, to Oni. Um, oh, protected. You know, everyone's got, oh, not everyone. Protected, that's the word. Hers is protected Oni. Uh, again, it's going to cost you a card, which for a summoning model is, uh, sorry, summoning master can be, uh, expensive. And uh, depending on a particular situation, um, and she can also uh, she has a bonus action where she can remove uh, corpse scrap or ski markers uh, to heal two per marker removed. Also, 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 the summon model gets flicker at the start of their activation. <laughs> but it, where where it matters though, uh, Alex is is what happens at the end of the activation, right? Yeah. So, so, and I think I already know the answer to this. Um, like if it doesn't matter if it has three or six flicker at the end of the activation, the same thing happens. Yeah. There's absolutely no, no upper cap. Yeah. yeah. Alex, I, I want to talk a little bit. I mean, boy, I mean, you, you have a lot of pressure on her three AP, uh, because, you know, except for the bonus action to heal herself, you know, she's, she's using an AP to, to summon she's using an ap to potentially remove some flicker but it looks like she has some decent attack actions um one one that even has an execute trigger um do you find yourself using those attack actions or is she really tied up kind of keeping the crew up and running um yeah i i, I do find myself using the attack actions it probably uh, uh, this is probably a, a bit different from some of your other people's experiences, but maybe more than the summon. Uh, yeah. the, the, the summon, the summon is when, you know, when you've got the cards or when you need the models for specific situations, but actually, um, the two attack actions she's got are, are, are really useful. So, um, the, the melee attack and other mouth to feed, um, 
you know, you start six, which is which is good. Uh, but you're looking at two, four, six damage damage so track. Good. Uh, yeah, and, and like you said, the execute trigger. So you can sort of later game when someone's run, run out of running out of resources with their stones. It's late in a turn, someone's running out of the cards, um, and you go in with a, a couple of executes on on something. It can be it can be quite swingy. Um, yeah, so I, it, it just means she's got a bit of protection. People have to think maybe twice before before going into her as as, as heavy as as they would. Yeah, yeah, that that offensive capability becomes its own defensive tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just persuades people to maybe stay away a little bit. Yeah, um, the other one, reaching tendrils, um, is really really useful. So it, it is a it is a projectile, but it's it's that six, uh, ignores friendly fire, and it just pushes the target six inches. Um, there's a couple of triggers on it, but to be honest, I, I don't really get very much use out of them because they're triggers the rip and tear and coordinate attack. So they're mainly for if you're pushing enemies. Um, but a lot of the time I'm pushing friendlies around with, with, with uh, reaching tendrils, just with a hair, push it, pushing a, pushing a friendly model six inches is really, um, really impactful. You know, if you, for, for that flexibility, it gives that crew the, the, the speed and the ability to respond right. on the board where, where you need it to. Well, and we've talked about it uh, so many times here on the podcast that especially in third edition, positioning is everything. Um, almost every single thing you do to score has to do about where your model is on the board. So any type of ways to push your own models or even be able to push your opponent's models. I mean, the more you play the game, the more you realize how powerful that is. Yeah, yeah, I, I, exactly. It's really uh, we'll get we'll get into schemes uh, uh, later on, but it's really good for for denying certain schemes or trying to guarantee yourself um, th- th- some of those points. So it's it's really really important for those for that point scoring. It doesn't feel as flashy as uh, as summoning something huge and hitting them. It doesn't feel as flashy as going in and executing someone, uh, pushing someone six inches. But if it gets yeah. you the points, um, that's that's what the game's about, really. Yeah, well, and, and six inches is a, is a big deal. I mean, with so many of the pushes we see out there are two-inch pushes, three-inch pushes. A six-inch push is, is a lot. Um, the last thing I think it's worth mentioning um, before we take a break is the fact that she has built-in Arcane Reservoir. Um, <laughs> we, yeah. Which is, yeah, which is a good thing, days. right? <laughs> yeah, and, and she needs it. Well, yeah. maybe she doesn't need it, but, but I, I appreciate it. You know, she's a summoner. Uh, the seven cards is, you know, means you're more likely to get the ones you want. And, and, and actually, maybe we'll get onto this in, at some point, but there is quite a bit of pressure on the crew for cards, or, or I find there is. So, so the seven cards is really, is, is. So, Greg, when you're building an Oni crew out of curiosity, um, how, how stone hungry is that crew? I mean, how many stones do you like to have in your cash? Um, I, one of the kind of, kind of core, uh, Asami crews I tend to run. I have nine. Um, I run, yeah, I yeah, run quite I heavy. Yeah, I can see that. Um, that, that, that nine tends to, um, frequently actually drop, well, anywhere between five and nine. Uh, you know, if, if I'm in a matchup and I kind of feel that I need a particular upgrade, um, you know, losing, dropping down to seven is not too bad. Um, or mm-hmm. if I feel, um, I might need a particular tech piece or particular support piece and, that's going to cost me a couple of extra stones to swap a model out or add a new one. And I dropped, you know, five or six. It's not too big a deal. Um, mainly because I'm, I'm trying to trade off, you know, what I might spend those stones on during the game, um, yep. for, um, an ability which I'm, I'm going to use all game long. Uh, it's more of a, a, a meta call than anything else. Right, right, exactly. Well, guys, let's take a quick break. When we get back from this break, what I want to do is I want to focus more on um, what what uh, models uh, Greg and Alex are bringing in uh, to their own crew. So we're going to talk about building a crew. We'll be right back. Howdy, friends. Did you know on Spotify, you can listen to all of your favorite artists and podcasts in one place for free? You don't even need a premium account. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including your favorite pod, Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. On Spotify, it's easy to follow your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. Premium users can download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are. They make it easy to share what you're listening to with all of your friends on Instagram. So help support all of the content coming from Third Floor Wars and download the Spotify app. Search for Tabletop Talk on Spotify or browse podcasts in the Your Library tab. Make sure to follow us so you never miss an episode of Tabletop Talk. (music) 
so now that we got kind of a feeling of um, really, which I think makes Asami just a cool, cool, cool master and only a cool keyword. What I'd like to do is get a sense from these guys. Um, what are when they're building a crew and despite whatever the pool is, the strategy is, uh, regardless of what the opponent is, um, are there models that they just always hire? Um, obviously, we'll start with a totem. But um, what are some other models that just always seem to make it into the crew? And then let's get into the summons a little bit. So, Alex, um, let's first let's talk about the totem. Can you give me an idea of what Asami's totem does? Yeah, so he um, he, he's a bit of a supporty totem. Uh, he can remove uh, flicker and potentially on the trigger he can remove conditions. So he tends to follow around some of the oni and maybe remove flicker from them just to keep them keep them alive a little bit longer, allowing them to to get those um, positives flipped to their their attacks or or their defensive jewels. Um, so he tends to be a little bit of a support totem. Um, he do, he can put up, as he's quick action, he can put up a, an aura of concealment, which com- comes in handy because you've got to remember we are, uh, in, 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 when we're staying in keyword, we're, we're very melee centric crew. We're not, we're not a ranged crew really. Guy, yeah. Um, and, um, I suppose one, one really interesting thing about him is that if, um, he's got an ability, the, the true power, um, and, and that's when, if you lose a Sami in the game, when, when she dies, you get to attach an upgrade to him. And it just makes him a bit of a beast in combat. It puts his damage track up from from quite small, I think like one, two, four or something. It put, puts it up to three, four, five or three, four, oh, six nice. or something. Yeah. Um, and he can also, um, the flicker becomes quite beneficial. He can discard flicker to reduce damage that he takes. So he can become a little bit of like a, like a melee monster when, when a Sami dies, which, which is, um, which is quite fun. It, to be honest, it doesn't happen very often. He's usually dead by the time a Sami dies, but, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite, I quite like it fluff wise and story wise. Exactly. But also, you know, he can, he can pack a punch if he needs to. Um, he's often, if he's not following around some other people of the crew, um, re- removing that flicker. Sometimes he's a bit of a bodyguard for Asami. You know, he, he's a, an only to pass on the attacks to with protected. Right. Um, and with manipulative, you know, he, he, he's not, he's not that impactful. So you don't really need to activate him early in a turn. Um, you know, turns two or three or four, you know, but, um, so with manipulative, passing on attacks to him can, can actually really, you know, really is, can scupper your opponent's plans, really, if they're trying to, if you pass on attack to him and then it's manipulative and they miss. So. Um, and he's insignificant, which which I r- actually really like in totems because it means he's not a liability mm-hmm. in, in some of you know with with some of the strats and schemes. So yeah, I, yeah. I like him. I'm on yeah, Jeff. no question. Greg, how about you? What are your thoughts on the totem? Uh, yeah, I um, I, I pretty much uh, the only thing I wanted to add to what um, Alex said there was that it's worth noting that he still gets to he removes all his flicker when he attaches um, the upgrade, um, and oh, then nice. um, he can actually. And um, because of say his damage, then um, jumps up. Um, he does actually become, a, a, especially you know, he, Sammy tends to die towards the end of the game, um, and you can mm-hmm. actually kind of trade for for your opponent's pieces really well um, by chucking a couple of focus attacks in. You know, with minimum damage. You know, it's something like I think it's, he tops out at six. It's like three, four, six, six or something like that. He goes up and he, to. He's got crit strike. Um, but with, oh, wow. you know, <laughs> and he's got crit strike, and he has the ability. Uh, what another one of his triggers? Uh, he can gain a flicker token. Um, to take the same action again, so he can potentially, you know, put out four focus attacks um, on three, four, six, and then uh, he will immediately die after that. Um, but that's right. a hell of a lot of pain coming out of um, just a little totem, um, which again, it doesn't really happen that often. He, tend- he tends to die first um, before a Sammy, but um, it can really take someone. You know, he, he can come out of nowhere. Um, with, with the Asami Soul upgrade, um, especially, again, if they're split up, suddenly, um, you know, once Asami dies, one side of the board comes safe, another side of the board can come, become actually really dangerous. Nice. Um, because yeah. you've got this little blue guy running around stabbing things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. So, Greg, after the totem, uh, what is one of your first hires in a Noni crew? So one, one of the things I never actually leave home without is um, a Kaname, um, these beautiful little trash goblins. Um, and w- one of the reasons uh, for that is their ability um, to basically drop a scheme scrap or course marker um, in base contact with the model as a bonus action. Um, mm-hmm. Now we do gain a flicker to do it, um, and because it's, it's 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 a cost gaining a flicker. So you, even if you black joke at that bonus action, you've paid your cost. Um, a lot of the Sam- Sammy's uh, only models, a lot of their 
flashier abilities were quite you gain flicker. Um, again, going with that uh, candle burns twice as bright thing. Um, but they've also just got a great little melee attack. Um, oh, it's only sat four, but it's got a two inch range. Um, and it gives out all, slow automatically, which is just absolutely big. superb. Um, uh, yeah, really big. Um, and then you've got these, a couple of beautiful synergies around kind of corpse markers and poison. So it says they can actually pick up corpse markers themselves. Um, and it gives them poison three. Now, the angel don't um, take any damage from that. They actually heal the damage. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can also, uh, when they would gain flicker, you can actually just reduce your poison condition by two. So if they're, you know, they're not, um, you know, exactly front, frontline combat models. They've only got, you know, four wounds. Um, and, and the defense is uh, only four, pretty poor. Um, but if they can, you know, eat up your corpse markers from uh, your opponent's models, it's worth noting that, that only themselves don't drop uh, corpse markers or anything like that. Um, actually, once they get a stack of poison on them, um, they almost become immune to the, to the flicker. Right. Um, because when you again flick, you just dish your poison off on themselves. Um, you know, if you take a random pot shot or like a random blast mark or shockwave or something, um, again, that poison will just heal it back. Um, and so, so they, they become strangely durable to kind of chip damage. Um, and again, the ability to just drop a marker, you know, when engaged, um, also on return you're summoned as well, mm-hmm. which can be re- really, really important. Um, you know, dropping a scheme on return you summoned is massive. Um, dropping markers for a Sammy to pick up to heal. Um, again, also massive. Yep. So yeah, no, they are, they are beautiful, beautiful little Josh Goblins. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of value for four points. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. You get a lot of them. Um, again, they do die with stiff breeze, but they're not going to affect your opponent's crew. Um, obviously, the slow is massive, but it gets melee four. Um, most of the time, they oh, again, um, most of the way I play them anyway, they, they are slower than average scheme runners is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, I, I, I'd I agree with that. They sort of I usually start off start off with one in the crew, uh, sometimes two, but they, and they are a common summon. But that, that two-inch melee is really, really surprising. Yeah. So you, you, su- you summon them within six of a Sami, already engaging an enemy and you know they either walk you know they walk to get into engagement and then they hit you or then they have to disengage so it's almost a slow in itself hmm. but if but if an, if an if an akin army has gone you know so they charges someone uh, it, their, their their attack actually targets movement which is a little bit strange but i suppose can get around some some defensive triggers and things you yeah. know it, and you can you can spend a flicker on it to get you know positive to that to that stat four um, you know, you probably just poke them for one damage and a poison, but slow, and it's 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 crippling. You know, if you if you slow an enemy model and and they're also in your engagement but not engaging you, it's, it sometimes feels a bit like you've paralysed them from from M two E. Really, yeah, really, yeah. really, really impressive little, little. So you do that, and then they also for their quick action they vomit up a a scheme marker or, or another marker that you need, and then um, yeah, they they do a, an awful lot of work. Probably probably my favourite models in the crew little trash goblins very nice so you mentioned alex that you might you might you definitely hire one you might bring in two um after the akaname um where do you start looking as you uh are building your crew i'm an ozako she's 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 my main lady she comes in every single crew um, so she's a, a a 10 point henchman um and, I, and I, I think i take her in every crew just because um she's really really flexible um she's she can she can Beat face with a with a three four five damage track. Um, obviously, she can be spending flicker to make those focused attacks. Um, she's she's got she's movement six with flight. Um, yeah. She's got she's got terrifying. She's willpower. She's only she's only defense five, but she's got willpower seven. So you know she's she's hard to control by the enemy. But but she's movement six with flight, and then, um, so good. And then a really good damage track. Um, the other thing that she brings that I use. An awful lot is her quick action, uh, dark bargain. So um, it's, it's like an obey. Uh, the target, you need a five to cast it. The target suffers one damage. And well, actually, Amma gets a flicker on the on the trigger. So what, what it does is it, it you tell the target to take an interact action. And that can mm. be herself or that can be someone else. And that, that's really important, just get, getting those interacts down. It means you're, you're not having to, you know, other models aren't using their AP. But because, because it's a tactical action, she can tell herself to do it. Um, and there's a trigger on it with a mask where she gains a flicker, but instead of it being an interact action, she can take any action. So, oh, wow. nice. in a way, I sort of see her as a three AP beater. Yeah. 
Um, and with movement six of flight, she just she goes wherever I need her to, and um, and and kills things uh, or, or schemes. Like you know, like oftentimes we talked about movement and positioning um, in Malifaux, and some sometimes people will do like a, this sort of like refused flank sort of business, or or they'll just run away, or or, or stuff will die where she is, and. Often we're, we're with a normal beater, maybe they're stuck there while they're trying to yep. reposition. But with her being able to interact for a quick action, she can put two bombs down if, she, if, it's, mm-hmm. if it's explosives, or she can put two scheme markers down for harness the layer line. You know, so she can. It doesn't feel too bad her having to to scheme run for a t- as a ten point model because she's got three AP almost, and she's dangerous. That that min three savage bite is a nasty attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. She can be a bit. Um, she can feel a bit squishy, actually. Like I, I tend not to run her up the middle uh, because with defense five, I know she's a hen- I know she's a she's a henchwoman and she's got terrifying. But she does well, anyone can go down to concentrated attacks. So she tends right. to sort of like dance around on the flanks for me. Um, she's quick enough to eat a, to catch up and eat an, eat an opponent's scheme runner. Um, and if she does take a bit of damage, she's got um, she's got two triggers on her attack one after killing and one after dealing damage where she heals that amount. So she's really, really resilient from just your opponent putting like two, three, four damage on here and there. She mm-hmm. just tends to heal it up uh, when, when she, when she, as she attacks and as she kills people. But if they, if they put loads of, loads of focus on her, uh, she'll go down. So for me, she tends to be on, on the edges a little bit, but I, I love her. I'm an Ozako. She's, she's, uh, she's wonderful. And often it's, um, it's her that Amanjaku, the totem is following around, removing the flicker. So that she yeah. can she can have that effective three AP um, every turn, and and that's we, we talked a little bit about soul stones. And Greg was saying he takes quite a high cash. I t- I tend to take quite a high cash as well, usually between five and eight. And mm-hmm. sometimes you want them so that you can be guaranteeing the trigger on um on, on her quick action, so that she can be having that third AP, or she be, she can be giving that third AP to someone else, whether right. that be a, a Jorogumo to charge or any of the other key models in the crew that, uh, that if you need them to do something. So, so Greg, is there any other core Onis that you're hiring or, or do you start flexing uh, right away to a uh, versatile or out of keyword? Uh, yeah. So before we get on to that, I just want to touch on, on something else with, um, with Amino Zako, if that's okay, please. Um, going back to what Alex said uh, with the, um, the, the high source stone cash, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly why I have quite a high source stone cash myself. Um, it's a, you know, a Sammy wants a stone for summons, Amonosaka wants a stone for her bonus action. And, and, and the other thing is that she does have a tactical action to lay down hazardous terrain. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure about you, Alex, but I, I don't think I've ever used this. <laughs> I've, I've never, I've never used it. That's why I didn't <laughs> mention it. <laughs> yeah. I just, I know we, um, in, in, in the kind of 10 Sunders uh, Facebook message group, we had a really, kind of, actually really long, really good discussion about kind of this ability and, and the hazardous terrain in general. Um, so I thought I might just touch on kind of why why don't, why don't we love this model, but we actually just don't use one of her kind of core actions. Um, and, and part of that's the cost. Um, you know, it, it needs a suited card uh, to actually get the, uh, the hazardous terrain off. Even though it's a four-inch bubble and on a 50 mil base, that's huge. Uh, but you also have to gain a flicker token for it. And so I'm a little bit like, when, when it comes to kind of, yes, you can potentially deny space with it, except you haven't really denied space. What you've said is that if your opponent wants to interact within that space, there's like an additional tax on top. Um, and if you're playing against kind of a, a, a above average, a good opponent, um, they're going to know if that cost is worth paying. Right. And if it is, you know, if it scores you points, you only got an eight point game. A good player is going to take that choice. So it it, it doesn't really, uh, you know, it helps you against weaker players, but that it doesn't help you against kind of you know the, the cream of the crop, which uh, is, is kind of what I look for in a model. Yeah. And then going yeah. back to your to your original question, there, Craig, um, I think that is pretty. Oh no, Tengu, beautiful, beautiful Tengu. Um, <laughs> So again, this is this is this is um, again one of my favorite only models, um, mainly because of that that dark bargain um, ability that that we spoke for with uh, Amano Zako. Unfortunately, this guy doesn't have the trigger to obey any model, but then he's only four points. So if, yeah. if he did, he'd probably be way way above the power curve. Um, but he still has movement six. He still has flight. He can stop for any models getting distracted and slow. Um, but it does cost you a card. And again, I, I don't think I've ever used it. Um, he has the standard flicker stuff, but his his attacks are nothing to write home about, really. 
Um, th- this guy's main job is is scheme running. Um, so walk six, uh, move six. Sorry, with flight um, is absolutely superb. Um, he also has dark bargain. Um, so again, he can um, dark bargain himself, so he can move twelve inches and drop a scheme marker. Um, he can yeah, also then big. cause someone else to interact instead. Uh, which again is we're going back to to what we said at the very start of the uh, the podcast about the shoot. Our Sammy really rewards uh, planning ahead and, and and really managing your side of the game because you know you can summon a Tengu to to fly twelve inches and then tell someone else to interact. But to do that, you need to have that other model in the correct place. So the great little little force motor players um, they have a little bit of healing as well. But again, it's it's a bit of a more of a corner case issue. They have a, a, a pulse that can. Uh, heal all models, so it actually includes your opponents uh, within five inches, um, one damage. Um, now you can potentially do that twice by gaining a flicker token, but but for me, they they you know they're little scheme bots um, with again the potential to get three AP, even though one of those is an interact. Right, right. So, um, I mean, so and obviously we're not done building the crew yet, but. You know, the two of the key models that you guys have brought up are, are, are um, you know, two out of the three are four, four stone models. Um, what, what's what's the is there any other big models outside of AMA that you're bringing in? Um, is that where you start flexing out to versatile, Greg? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, so t- two of the models that I uh, large models that I quite um, commonly take um, that, that are versatile are the Dawn Serpent and the Yasunori. Now, Dawn Serpent is is one of my favorite models in the game. Um, mainly because a lot of what he does isn't isn't flashy. Now, he's movement seven and flight, which by itself is superb. Um, he's lightning fast. Now, just and he also has um, agile, so he, he's really hard to pin down. Mm-hmm. Um, also hard to kill. Um, has his own built in healing. He's very um, self contained. You know, doesn't require anything from Asami. Doesn't require any of her AP, which you're already trying to juggle um, by keeping all of his only around. And managing all of his flicker system, because um, there's only you know, Sammy only has three AP, so she can only really remove you know a maximum of three flicker a turn. Um, and so I like having a few big versatile models in there that she doesn't have to worry about, or I'm on you know, uh, I'm on Jack who doesn't have to worry about. Yeah. Um, and the Dawn Serpent again, you know, he lives, he survives. He's also got a three, four, five damage track. You know, no triggers on it at all, um, but it's a stat six, um, so it's just really, really consistent without any kind of extra support from a Sammy, which, um, again, I suppose when it comes to kind of be a competitive play and not knowing exactly how, what models your opponent's going to put down or how the game's going to go, I really like that consistency. Um, and I really like his ability with, with the Agile and the Movement 7 and the Flight to just switch gears that he can quite happily scheme and then dash into the middle, you know, just to start ripping face with, you know, melee 6, um, min damage 3. Or he can he can go the other way around. He can come up the centre and then bounce out to the flank to to drop a scheme marker somewhere late game. The other model is Yasunori. Again, very very similar reasoning to a Dawn Serpent. Uh, very consistent model. Stats really really good. Um, again, movement seven with flight, superb. Um, his unnatural reflexes trigger um, is absolutely brilliant. So so but on the face of it, he wants he wants masks, uh, and the Sami also wants masks. But because he he generates his suits from the number of cards in your opponent's hand. So in early game, uh, sorry, early in the turn, when you know, your opponent's got a full control hand of six, he's essentially armor three, um, which com- combined with hard to wound means he, he, he takes a lot of putting down. It's so good. Um, it also yeah. doesn't, it's, yeah, it doesn't, because the fact it doesn't reduce to zero um, is absolutely brilliant. So, you know, we don't have to spend too many cards defending him if, at all. Yeah. Um, his mm-hmm. attacks, again, melee six, positive flip built in, superb. Again, mask triggers, but he, he can get those built in. So he needs essentially nothing from, from Asami himself. Um, and one of my favorite abilities he actually has is um, his bonus action, the Wind's Wrath. And all that does, it's, it's a three-inch pulse from his 50 mil base, um, and it moves himself um, and other models in range up to an inch. And it just randomly has loads of little, um, excuse me, um, a lot of utility, um, especially about keeping him um, mobile. You know, for example, mm-hmm. if, if someone has, uh, let's say, a one-inch engagement range, um, if they're engaging him, then he pushes them one inch away and he pushes an inch away. So unless, you know, you've got a two-inch engagement range and you're in base-to-base with them um, at the start of combat, providing that you, you know, your the opponent's model 
and the Yasunori has, has space to move, he actually mm-hmm. can't be tied down. And then with flight, he just leaps over the top and, and goes off and does his thing. Um, and again, I, I just really, really like the, the consistency. I know what I'm getting. Um, and I've got lots of different options. Again, if needs be, he can scheme uh, yep. because he's fast enough, because he has flight. Um, yeah, I mean, w- what we're really seeing now as you guys go through this is we're seeing incredibly fast incredibly versatile and flexible models um, and uh, a lot of flight too. So um, I'm really starting getting a feel of kind of the play style that the two of you guys are building up to. Um, Alex, how about uh, generic um, 10 Thunder upgrades? Is there any generic 10 Thunder upgrades that you're finding yourself using with this crew? Yeah, a, a, a couple. I don't think I rely upon them as much as some people, but um, it, it depends on the situation really. So um and, and obviously with the hires. So sometimes I'll hire um, a samurai and sometimes I'll have trained ninja on the samurai just so that it can, as we've been talking about, really, really sort of fast repositioning crews. Trained ninja just allows your samurai to, to from the shadows up there and, and sort of start acting straight away. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and obviously depending on what master your opponents declared, but master agent is always a consideration. Um, the upgrade that, that turns off resist, resistive triggers in a bubble. So, you know, yeah. your, opponent, your opponent declares collect or, or zip, then you can you can stick a mass stage in, on on Yasunori, uh, maybe maybe even another one on Amanozako, and you can all, almost guarantee being able, you know having that those two six inch bubbles to turn off resistance triggers. So, um, yeah, they're, they're 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 really important. Train ninja or ma- mass agent, but they usually just. Um, as and when the situation requires. And I'm, I think the more I play, the more masters I'm getting experience playing against, uh, the more I'm finding uh, when to use them and, and, and when not to. I'm not a sort of person that just sticks them on because I think, oh, actually, I'd like to deploy this guy a bit closer or I think that maybe um, hard to kill is really good on that. I've, I've got to have a purpose for it because, you know, we've said we want a high cash with a, with a Sami. Two stones is, you know, it's part of that cash, isn't it? It's it's, um, it's eating into that cash. So, yeah. If I've got if I've got a purpose, then then I'll I'll use the upgrades. Yeah. So, Greg, can we talk a little bit about the summons? Um, I, I mean, obviously, I don't want to cover every single model that she can summon, but I'd like to know what you consider some key summons. The top two uh, everyone goes for, um, or at least I tend to go for our, our Joe Gomu um, and Katashiro. Um Obsidian only come in a, a kind of a close third. Um, so Joe Gomu are your, your kind of big flashy spider boy summon. Absolutely great stats. Uh, well, um, the damage is, is three, four, six, two inch range. Um, with a stat six. So you're already starting at a great place before you even think about having positive flips, um, on that attack and damage because of, of flicker. Uh, you've got puncture. Um, so you can potentially have even more positive flips on your damage. Mm-hmm. And then they've also, um, have a couple of weird little bonus actions um, where they can actually stop healing in your opponent's crew, um, which can be randomly very clutch. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're playing something like in the morning, um, you know, to suddenly turn turn off that healing can actually be a massive deal. Um, it's also range ten, which which uh, I remember for the first time I looked at it, just struck me as being just really far for reasons I couldn't understand. But hey ho. Um, <laughs> He, he he um he yeah he can also um push other friendly models um away from him. Now it's only a four yep. inch push and, and in a way itself um is it can be somewhat restrictive. Um but he's quite good at if, if you've got a model uh you know that, that's been engaged and you need to free it up. You know, the Joe Gomer could charge that model. If if you don't even kill the enemy model, um you could always just scare your own friendly model away. Right, um, and so you kind of still done the job. You've got a little bit of backup. Um, they they can also heal themselves uh, when they kill uh, an enemy model, as well as removing a flicker as, as part of the general keyword abilities. Um, they can also just heal two damage, um, which is really really good. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at that mark of vengeance, Greg, and um, I, I, the first thing I notice is it's obviously it's not an opposed duel, right? Um, or no, it is an opposed duel, but you don't have a target number. Yes, yeah, yeah, willpower, yeah. 
Yeah. So with that, but with no target number, it, it and, and I noticed it's got a nice little uh, shielded on a RAM. So um, I would, that would, uh, you know, make some of your mid, mid RAMs uh, pretty valuable because I don't, depending on what model you're doing it against, you, you really question whether they're going to spend a high card to try to resist that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, kind of the issue um, that I kind of have with the trigger um, is that it also directly competes with uh, puncture. Right, um, and so with, with your stat six, sometimes you actually don't want to use flicker um, for mm-hmm. for the hit because you know stat, stat six is generally gets the job done. Um, but by by able being able to to drop a mid to high ram in to, to get an additional uh, positive flip, that makes sense. Again, especially if it's a summon model, um, being able to kill a model without spending the flicker for the focus and, and remove one, you kind of got a net benefit for you know. Seven eight of rams is is really really good value. So Alex, um, what are some other key uh, summons? Um, so so Greg mentioned Obsidian Oni and Katashiro. Um, so uh, Asami tends to be summoning uh, for me anyway uh, at the start of the game the the, the bigger summons so Jorogumo Obsidian Oni, and then later game when I'm sort of maybe trying to get those points or I'm trying to bog down the opponent those smaller summons Akinami Tengu Katashiro. Um, so they can do the scheming. So um, let's talk about Obsidian only. So, so these guys are you need a, an eleven to summon them because they, they cost seven. Um, they, they're sort of like the the tanky. They've got armor. Um, they've they've got ruthless, which is which is you know really really helpful. Um, the other thing they can do is they can remove destructible markers as a quick action. So nice. they are so so these guys are answering answering problems. You know if your if your opponent's playing Raspy or or um, or Titania, you know, they can be removing those markers to sort of like free up, um, free up the space and free, free up the positions. Um, and then they can, you know, the, the melee six, the two, three, four damage, which, you know, isn't anything to write home about, but we, they've got crit strike and they can give burning on triggers. And they've also got, they do have a ranged attack, one of, one of the sort of rare ranged attacks in the crew, um, that, that can give out burning and can drop scrap markers. So it's a way of, of getting scrap markers. Um, I think I should talk about, flicker bombing things or, or I think people have referred to referred to that term of summoning something and then going in and obsidian only are often the 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 sort of target of this you know some, summoning obsidian only the poster child really yeah the poster child of, of, of this because it's because they've got demise um, flaming too so when they're killed um, models within two inches suffer two damage and burning two um, oh. so you, yeah so you can you can make an obsidian only um, you can push it forwards uh, push it so you can push you can walk forward with this army five inches you could summon an obsidian only another six inches ahead of you and they've got a 40 mil base and then you push them another further six inches ahead so they're now uh, 12 70 uh, like 19 almost 19 inches up the board mm. if, if you've got a straight path and then they can go in and they can do two focused attacks with the flicker and then they die um and that can be really really impactful you know two two sort of stat six focused attacks and then dying to do two damage to everyone around. I think I think it works against players that either aren't expecting it or or running crews that that, that ball up that, that really right. need to sort of be close together. But I think the more people play against the Sami, they'll come to expect that and they'll start countering it. Um, mm-hmm. So I actually don't like I, I usually actually find myself not playing in that sort of way. I tend to Act like I'm going to do that. Summon Obsidian Oni, push them forward, go in with the Obsidian Oni, but not actually spend all my flicker, not actually do the focus attacks, just make two normal attacks. Because then actually, you know, from the opponent's point of view, you've got an Obsidian Oni sort of stuck in your crew. It's armor <laughs> one. It, you know, it's got, it's got seven wounds. And if they do kill it, it's going to explode. Right. And if they don't kill it and they, you know, they disengage, they move around, it disrupts their plans. Well, then, Next turn, you can always do the, you know, you can always have two more focus attacks and then explode. And yeah, you might yep. not catch as many people in the aura, but you've given them a turn where they've had to be trying to deal with the this forty mil uh, based armor one model in their crew. And if they kill it, you don't you don't really care that much, you know. But but usually, I'm trying to find maybe I'm not killing my summons the turn that I summon them. Um, I'm usually trying to get two turns out of them i'm trying to eke out a little bit more value but maybe that's because i'm i'm greedy (laughs) (laughs) i'm not not sure greg do you find yourself using the flicker bomb or um 
Um, not not that often. Uh, th- these guys are, are kind of my like butterfly jump assassins um, because models with butterfly jump tend to have relatively low wounds. Um, and so what I that's kind of when I tend to go for the bomb. You know, like um, one and other monks just just have a target on their heads because um, you can get so far forward. You can generally charge the model. Um, I'll spend the flicker because I want to be in the upper upper uh, damage bands, and then they're going to butterfly jump away. Um, but if I've got you've got an AP left, you can just walk, stand next to it, end your activation, another two damage, <laughs> another two burning, yep. um, and that generally puts them in the ground. Yeah, and and the, the ranged attack is good for that sort of thing as well. You can go in, you can make an attack. Someone jumps away, so you shoot them instead. You know, you, you you're getting you're still getting your two attacks on them if you need to. Um, so that's what I find against butterfly jump people that have got melee exactly, and, yeah. melee attacks and shooting attacks they, you know, they, they're good, good around that sort of thing yeah well it's two damage and two burning on top of it exactly and, and you know what's going to happen right like if you shoot you can miss yep. um, yeah so if you definitely need that guy dead just stand next to them and uh, <laughs> uh, demise well and I, and I love that nasty choice Greg that you talked about which is okay um, I'm not going to kill him but I'm going to leave him there and, and make him a, a pain in your behindicus. Um, and if you want to kill him, that's great. I'm a huge fan of you killing him too, uh, because here's four damage by the end of the turn. Exactly, and they spent uh, they spent resources killing him as well. Um, right. Um, I suppose that's what you'll find as well, Alex. Is yeah. These guys, because you're summoning on four wounds and you've got armor, you, you take a lot of putting down. Um, yeah. And if you really want, you can spend flick on the defense. Yeah. Yeah, you can. They can go into you, and you can spend the flicker on on the defense. They attack you, and then you explode if you need to. Yeah. So yeah, they take a lot, a lot of putting down. And I think that's what I like about the crew with Akinami, sort of slowing people, engaging them. You know, obviously, you only getting in your face, and then you know, taking AP and resources. Jorogumo, you can't, you can't, well, you, you can. You can't charge. You can't end within two inches and uh, and make an attack action if you've done a charge. So they're hard to get into as well. And with a two inch melee, they can sort of bog people down. So the entire crew is really good at holding up. It's got some models that are really good at holding up people and getting in the way and draining AP. Well, and I th- I think the theme that is is it just getting stronger and stronger, guys. You're making the case of is just how flexible all of this is, and the flexibility just seems everywhere between the movement, the pushes, uh, the range of summons. I think is very interesting. The fact that I can you know s- you know bring in some big nasty things. I've got a lot of really strong low cost models. Uh, Alex, you made the point that you know her attack actions are legit, so maybe you don't even summon uh, during her activation. And, and then to have um, Yasunori and the Dawn Serpent really be in their own little mini crew um, doing whatever needs to be done, uh, but that, that's very, very flexible. Um, and it just seems every aspect it, we're, we're seeing that. Yeah, because if you've taken Dawn Serpent, Yasunori, and Amanozako, you know, I know Dawn Serpent's nine, but you've got oh, 29 stones on three models there, but they. They're all reasonably self-sufficient. And yeah. Ozako can obey Yasunori to take a walk on the first oh. turn. And then you're seven inches further up the board, you know, and, you, and you've got a nine-inch threat with four attacks, or you've got a 16-inch threat with two attacks after you've walked seven inches right. up the board. So, yeah, the threat range is, is, is there on the first turn if you, if you need it. Yeah, the speed is, is pretty insane in this crew that you guys are putting together. Yeah. Now, Alex, we were talking offline, and um, you kind of mentioned kind of an interesting build that you've been playing around with. Can we talk about that? Yeah. So uh, we've mentioned a lot of self-sufficient models before before the break, a lot of those big sort of beaters, really fast. Um, but another part of my crew that I, I take quite often, maybe um, 70, 80% of the time, is um, is a Minako Ray and, and, and a summoning package. So Minako Ray, she's, um, she's last blossom, but she's versatile. Um, so she's um, eight stone henchman, um, and she's she's just she's just a really really good model. So um, she's got laugh off; she can't be moved. Um, she's got charge through, so she gets a positive when she charges. Um, and if she kills someone that has it activated, she gets fast. So you know she's she's a reasonably BT model, um, but um, she's got for an AP. She can summon a Katashiro uh, with a ten of uh, a ten of tomes. So. She has to use a scrap marker or a shadow marker. That's why where she fits in with Last Blossom, um, mm-hmm. but she summons a Katashiro. So 
what I'll often take is I'll take Minako Ray and, and one Akinami or, or maybe Minako Ray and two Akinami and they'll sort of deploy maybe with a, with a Sami in, in sort of deployment and, and all those flexible flying fast other versatile models are sort of in, you know somewhere else in the deployment zone but um, you can have your Akinami walking up uh, vomiting up a, a, a scrap marker and then maybe interacting to put a scheme marker down so that the Akinami will put two markers down as well as walking up the board and then Minako Ray can turn turn that turn one of those scrap into a Katashiro and nice. the scheme marker can be for Asami to eat uh, with a quick action just for healing because she's going to she's going to use some health either for her summoning or for removing flicker so the, the Akinami will put down a couple of markers to support Asami but also the one of those is a scrap so that uh, Minako can summon a Katashiro and it just eases off some of the pressure on um, on Asami summoning a Katashiro. Right. Minako can summon one to you know a Katashiro turn one, and Asami can summon uh, you know a, a Jorogumo or an Obsidianoni. And um, it's just a really good a really good first first turn. She doesn't tend Minako doesn't tend to be summoning Katashiro all game long. She'll just maybe summon one. Maybe she'll summon a second one on turn two, but then she'll tend to go get stuck in. Um, but I really like Minako Ray. She 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 um she's brilliant. And she's got a quick action that can draw a card if you've got less cards than your opponent. Yeah, no, I was good. it's it's worth noting, I think, that um unlike Asami summons, um Minako's Katashiro don't come in with an upgrade. Mm. Um so they don't have that kind of ticking time bomb um with Flicker Edition. Yeah. That a lot of um Asami's other so well all Asami's other summons um actually do carry. Yeah. So again, uh, going by what I said, it just relieves that little bit more pressure off Asami yourself. Yeah, and I got to tell you, as as a rule, I tend to not be real crazy about like two model combos like this. Yeah. But what I what's interesting about what you're talking about, Alex, is you know the 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 four stone barfing gremlin that you're bringing in <laughs> to help her is a good model on his own, right? Yeah. So yeah, he's definitely enabling the summons when you need it, but it's not like that's the only thing he can do for you. Yeah. Yeah, he's only doing it really turn one. He's, 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 and he's putting a marker down for Asami to, to heal off anyway. Um, so it, it's only for the first turn, really. He puts a scrap marker down. You get a Katashiro and then he's off doing his own thing, engaging people, trying to scheme. Actually, more likely he's dying, but you know, he's, he's getting in the way and he's, and he's doing his own thing. It's not, it's not a combo that you st- stick to. I, I'm not a, a big fan of those sort of combos, but it's just it gets you an extra Katashiro. You know, and, and they are—they're they're really good. Just gives you an extra scheme runner that they'll move into a better position or hide somewhere on turn one, and then on turn two, it's going to go and try and score a point or something. So Min- Minako is brilliant, and and the other thing she does actually, people really don't want to attack her because of her um, her defensive and willpower trigger, uh, right. which is is karmic debt. I don't actually have it in front of me, but that's because I think Jamie Varney stole it at nationals. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he didn't. He's like, I don't like that. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm going to take that back to London with me. Or, I don't know, but down <laughs> south somewhere. It's all the same to me. Um, Do you know what? So, I, 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 the, the, hope, so I hope it's not Jamie that stole it and there's some guy just maniacally <laughs> laughing listening to this podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you'll, never, you'll never get to declare that, that defensive trigger again. Um, but So when, when someone attacks her... <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, when, when someone attacks Minako, um, it's built in on the defense. It's not built in on willpower, but she's a henchman, so she can stone for it. After resolving, um, so they don't have to succeed. You know, um, you give you give the model that attacked Minako, uh, karmic the karmic fate upgrade, and that just says whenever well, I think it says um, whenever Minako would take damage, the model with the upgrade also takes the same amount of damage. Oh, nice. Uh, so it, and, and if and if you kill the model with the upgrade. Um, you get a, a Wan Yudo, you know, the big w- rolling burning wheel guy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just like, you know, you attack Minako Ray, and then she goes in and kills that model that attacked her and summons summons yet another model, another movement mm. seven model that's unimpeded, you know, just adding to the to the massive movement of the crew. Um, well, so, and that's a huge that's a huge swing, right? You're yeah. taking out a model and bringing in a seven stone model. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, she's great. She's turn one. She'll summon the Katashiro. That's an extra model, and then doesn't happen very often. To be honest, actually, good players just don't attack her, and that's my right. advice. Just actually, just leave her alone, uh, because if you attack her, you're just gonna, you're probably gonna end up killing your model that attacked her, and maybe giving me another model. So 
most people just don't. Know. But if they're avoiding her, then, you know, she's able to, she's movement six, you know, she's able to do, you know, have a go at someone or maybe summon some more or even scheme, you know? So I was about to say she can score your points. Yeah, she can score points. So, so, uh, so yeah. Greg, one thing I think is interesting is um, you have mentioned offline that there's uh, a model that you like, the Terracotta Warrior, which all I hear is that that's a terrible model. Um, but can you talk uh, talk to us about how you like the Terracotta? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll start by saying that it is a generally, in most cases, in fact, almost all cases, it is a generally pretty terrible model. Um, but actually, I... Apart from with Asami, um, I actually love playing a Terracotta Warrior with Asami. Um, he takes, he takes for me, um, a lot, in a lot of Asami crews you see out there, there's, there's kind of this one slot, um, or sorry, for me, one slot, because I have a general, um, aversion to support models, um, which mm-hmm. of course is probably very well documented. Um, so commonly people will take something like a, um, a Tanuki, um, or a, uh, a low river monk. So low river monk is just pure, pure healing to try and manage that, um, that wound count for Sami, wounds are a resource. Um, the Tanuki can do a similar thing again, heal her and give her a focus to potentially make those summons a little bit easier. Um, but what I actually, some people take both, which, uh, I mean, I would honestly say is a mistake, but that's, uh, due to my play style, how I play. Um, the, the Terracotta Warrior, though, he, he's kind of what I put in that slot. Now, he doesn't actually heal a Sami. Um, he's got, but what he does have, though, are two tactical actions, which I think fit very, very well um, with the Sami's crew. Um, first one is, is just like you. Uh, so now, you only do this once per activation, um, and he has to be within five inches of a Sami to use it in, in, in the way I'm about to, to say. Um, and so what he does is he just basically copies um, the tactical action, non-bonus tactical action, um, of a, a model of a higher cost than a Terracotta himself, um, and he gets to use that action, and now, albeit with a with a cast of uh, level of minus two. Um, and what I actually use this for is to copy a mother's love. Um, oh, so that's the ability right. that, that the army uses to remove flicker and give focus, right? Um, because, you know, we talked about how aggressive a Sami kind of needs to be, how short range that is, and it does make it quite bubbly. But whereas with that Terracotta, I basically extended that bubble by a radius of five inches. Um, and yes, I'm casting it on a six instead of a four, but a six isn't still, you know, is nothing really to sniff at. I don't really find it to yep. be the end of the world. Um, he can also, he is significant, so he can actually, if he stands a little bit closer to a Sami, um, you know, he can chuck a ski marker out. Um, which then a Sami can then, as long as that's within two inches of a Sami, she can then pull it up to get her wounds back. Um, and so I found that actually by being able to remove a flicker, uh, you know, outside of a mother's love range, I'm not using, um, her ability where, you know, to, to take damage to prevent flicker at the end of an activation. So actually it, it, it kind of balances itself out. Instead of healing her, I'm causing her to use her wounds less. Which right. then kind of stops her dying to kind of random spikes of damage and things like that. Um, the other thing he can do, uh, again, tactical actions is he does have attack action, he does have attack action, but it's nothing to write home about. I'm not really going to touch on it at all. Um, but more of the other is, is his tactical action, his second one. Um, and this is where he can replace himself um, with a mini nor enforcer uh, that was killed during that game. And now you've got a Sammy here who's, who's basically summoning minions all the time. Um, so that's another potential way to get, um, you know, a Kadashiro, a Jogomu, um, for basically the same card that a Sami would use for, for summoning. Bear in mind he can stone, so it needs to be the sewered mask. Um, but again, it comes in without having two flicker added to it and without, yeah. um, a flicker upgrade. It does have kind of pseudo slow because of the way the place works. He's used, um, an AP. So it's only going to come in with one AP. Um, and it only comes in with three damage. So. Um, but some of these, you know, low cost models we were talking about, Tengu, Kaname, you know, coming in, uh, with only three wounds, sorry. It's not the end of the world. It just means you've taken one wound at some point. Uh, Joe Goma can heal themselves. Um, uh, but the other thing that, that's worth noting is the, or is the enforcer bit, um, because you can actually summon, uh, sorry, replace yourself into a Dawn Serpent if a Dawn Serpent's died. Oh. Um, oh, that's because good. Dawn Serpent costs nine. So you need a 13 of masks, but, you know, you, you, suddenly you're getting the Dawn Serpent back, uh, you know, who's move seven and has a yep. self built in heal is absolutely superb. Um, if you've got the Red Joker, um, you can actually bring Yasunori back. 
um, <laughs> which is again can be a colossal swing um, after after they've ground through through the Asanori suddenly he pops back up again only three wounds but it's a hell of a lot of offensive output potentially because he you know can have built in onslaught so he can replace himself charge you know bonus action um, for an inch charge seven inches two inch melee range with two attacks um, because of a trigger um, so yeah it's Really, in a Sami, I think he's got a really, really good spot as it does the uh, the Terracotta Warrior. Yeah, I bet. In a similar vein, uh, the Kamatachi is um, one of those models which I I don't take often. Um, he's very much um, dependent on the opposing master and, and what I think I'm going to see in the opposing crew. Um, so if if and, and that's purely uh, for his um, Wonder Weasel. Um, ability. So this is a once per activation ability, um, which after a model is summoned, um, I get a draw a card, which, you know, card draw for a summoner is is, is absolutely superb. Yep. Um, now, the drawback of this is if it was a friendly model that was summoned, I've got to discard a card. So this is more card cycling than it is card draw uh, in just a pure Asami crew. Um, now, however, if I'm playing against another summoner, mm-hmm. um, or I think, um, you know, it's a model... The, uh, or there's going to be a model in the crew which is going to summon other models. Um, let's say it's Zerado or something, for example, who you know might be summoning a Voodoo doll. When she's when the opposing crew summons, I draw a card, and that was not for any model. So actually, I get to keep that card. So for your opponent summoning models, he they actually um, let you draw cards. Um, and his um, his bonus action. He has a bonus action which I've actually the more I've kind of used it, the more I've enjoyed it. Um, and it's the, the Dust Devil ability, which lets him um, basically drop a 40 millimeter um, hazard terrain marker. And um, now for this one, he actually has to discard a flicker token to cast it mm-hmm. instead of gaining one. And because it's a cost, um, unfortunately, you can't uh, just gain that, gain a flicker on the jewel and then discard it later. Um, you, you need to have a flicker there to start with, which can be a bit tricky. But what, what I tend to do is either punch uh, the Terracotta Warrior with a Kamatachi and use a flicker on the hip. But right. actually flip the defense of the model um, and basically make myself miss, um, or at least get me on to try and get me to a to a double negative flip or something just to to keep the damage on the attack down. And once he's got the one flicker, you can just kind of run around uh, with your dust devil, um, and his attacks then can then move the dust uh, the dust devil marker about. So instead of moving, you know, an enemy model into Hazardous Terrain and causing damage, you actually move the Hazardous Terrain marker um, six inches, which yep. actually on a 40 mil base, you can tend to clip, you know, a couple of models, you know, generally minimum two, sometimes three or four, depending on how the game's gone. And actually that that little chip damage, um, which normally I don't really have much time for, but actually because it's only on a four stone insignificant model, um, it actually really adds up and, and combining that with a card draw I find when I'm playing against another summoner he still gives me value well I was I was about to say Greg I mean what a great tech piece for four stones when you know they've already declared a summoner master on their side because um, you know you're going to get value as, as a card cycle and then you know you're going to be drawing and what's crazy about that Wonder Weasel um, uh, ability I mean granted it's once per activation but uh, there's no range on it. So that summon could be happening, you know, 25 inches away from the Kamatachi and you're still drawing the card. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, sometimes, well, before before I kind of uh, realized how, how good the, the Dust Devil ability was, it was quite common that he would just stand behind a wood or a house mm-hmm. somewhere and just, just almost be like a pass token that got me cards. Um, but yeah, yeah. Because, no, yeah, as you say, it, it's, it's got no range. It's absolutely superb. So, guys, let's take a quick break. When we get back from this break, I want to find out, you know, and I have a feeling I might know the answer, but I want to find out if there's specific strategies and schemes that they feel that the Oni crew uh, performs well in. So we'll be right back.
Howdy friends, Craig here. With 3rd Edition Malifaux released, it's time for you to get a new mat with new deployment zones. We've tried every mat in the business and nobody has better quality and selection than mats by Mars. They're waterproof and they roll and unroll easily and they're even wet erase Marco compatible. They offer over 35 designs and let you add M3E overlays for making deployment and positioning a breeze. Check them out at matsbymars.com. They are offering a sweet discount for our listeners. After you found the perfect mat, use the promo code THIRDFLOOR to get 10% off your entire order. If you really want to support us in the notes of your order, request that our logo be put in the corner of your mat. It's the only way to make the best mat in the business even cooler. Again, that's Matt by Mars. Use the promo code third floor to get a 10% discount. Details are in the show notes. Well, how interesting is it to have two guys that, you know, have been playing uh, this Oni crew for a while and they're good buds too, and, but they really have already kind of found out their own little mini builds that they've been experimenting with and having success with. It's part of what I love about Malifaux is that there, I don't care what anybody says, there's no right way to play it. There's no right crew to build. Um, it's, it really comes down to how you want to get things done. And we're so early into this edition. I think we're going to start seeing some really interesting combinations, not just for, you know, master like asami but for a lot of the keywords that are out there so alex when um you know you're a 10 thunders player and uh, you're on your seventh round at nationals, <laughs> what strategies is there one or two strategies that come up that make you really consider bringing asami in um uh, yeah so uh it'll be plant explosives or corrupt idols they're the they're the two that uh, that i bring asami in uh, we, we've spoken about like this flexibility, this power, this speed that she has, um, <clears throat> and I think I think the reason I, I, I picked those strategies for her is because um, she's able to not have the disadvantages of playing the other strategies, if, if that yep. makes sense. So, um, so we talked about Flicker and uh, and uh, and her crew dying when they get to uh, models dying when they get to when they get to three Flicker in anyone's activation. Not only that, but a lot of her crew is actually quite vulnerable uh they're quite squishy so um so it makes reckoning such a, such an uphill struggle um yeah. when you're when you're playing a sami and, and also turf war when, when you're losing when you when i'm distracting people with models and bogging people down with models and, and losing them probably quite quickly um flipping those turf markers back to neutral can be quite um really really detrimental so so plant explosives and corrupted idols are the two strats that allow me to uh, play to her strengths without right. having those disadvantages. Well, and lucky for you as a 10 Thunders player is you've got strong other keywords for turf war and reckoning, right? So it um, it's not like uh, you don't have other options. So that's that's good. Um, Greg, let's let's think about schemes a little bit. Are, are there any schemes in particular um, that if they're in the pool and you, you've you got Asami, you're definitely going to be picking those schemes just because she's she's built to score them? Yeah, um, a lot of it's actually kind of centered around the uh, the marker heavy schemes, um, as you probably mm-hmm. can imagine about how much we've talked about uh, the ability to drop scheme markers all over the place. Um, you know, breakthrough. Uh, you know, we just we described playing very very fast crews. You know, getting across the ball is not not a massive problem. Um, dig their graves. I actually really like with her, um, hmm. mainly because it's it's the second point. Um, that, that, that she really, really shines in because um, you can create course markers with with Akaname. Um, so, so if you need course markers, you can just summon Akaname and they can just make them for you. Um, at the same time, Akaname and Asami herself can also remove um, course markers, and Asami can move uh, remove scrap markers. Uh, so you can actually deny your opponent, um, and only models don't drop quartz markers themselves. Yep. So it can be quite a hard scheme uh, for your opponent to score, but actually quite an easy one for you. Um, because even if you're, let's say, you're playing against Hoffman, and he's dropping, um, I suppose it doesn't really matter anymore, does it? I'm, I'm stuck in addition behind. But um, if you need quartz markers in a small corner of the board where Sammy's hiding, you, you just make some. Yep. And then you drop some scheme markers next to them. Yeah, that's, that's um, nice. It's absolutely superb. Um, Outflank is a great one. Yeah. And so much of what we talked about, Greg, is, is, you know, we've talked about how fast this crew is, um, these incidental markers and the ability to get markers down where they want them to be and the ability for you to get your models where they need to be and actually disrupt the positioning of other models. I mean, I look down the list of schemes and, you know, so many of them 
require some of that. And, and you've got that flexibility uh, to go in there. What I'd be curious to know, though, Alex, is if I'm if my opponent declares a Sami, are there schemes in the pool that I should make sure I don't take because she can really shut them down hard? Yeah, yeah. So you, when, when you when you're facing again when you're facing a Sami, um, she's the one that's going to be herself personally is the one that's going to be stopping your schemes. So um, we've mentioned that her quick action um, removes scheme scrap and corpse markers around her. So if you're if you're trying to do uh, search the ruins, you know, and you're trying to get you know trying to get into my half, and you're trying to put down scheme markers next to terrain, she can just walk up and eat them. Uh, same, yep. same, same with breakthrough. Same with harness the ley line because because she wants to be a little bit forward anyway. You know, she, we said that sort of ag- aggressive support ma- summoner master. She's she's probably going to be a little bit up towards the center line anyway. So she's going to be slightly hanging back, just behind the front line, but still up there. And she's just going to respond and eat your schemes when you put them down. That's so. So that's one. That's one way that she's going to. Um, Deny, deny your schemes. The other way is, is with her, um, with her tendrils, with her hair. So, she's, right. you know, if you, if, if I get a, an inkling that maybe you've taken claim jump, uh, and I, and I can't get someone up there, I could always, well, I could always push a friendly model up to contest it, or I could push the enemy model away. I think I'd push the friendly model up because it's less demand on the flips. But if I, if I really needed to, I could push a, an enemy model away for outflank. I can use the hair to, to push an enemy model out and deny that. That outflank point, um, and it, once someone goes for outflank, it tends to be a, a little bit obvious. So pushing them away, denying denying that point for that turn, and it gives you an entire the next turn to to kill one one flank of of, of your opponents to, to deny. Mm-hmm. So she'll deny outflank. She'll 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 deny uh, you know um, claim jump. Maybe take prisoner just because of some of the some of the summons. Um, she, she she's the one she can deny an awful lot she can deny an, an awful lot she can let's say eat, eat all the markers eat all the, the corpse markers for for dig uh, and push people around so she's the one that's going to be stopping you so maybe that leads into our next point about how to beat her actually <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're going to be headed in that direction yeah, yeah. so let's take a quick break guys and when we get back from this break i want to talk about two things one um i'm really anxious now to find out how to counter uh the sony crew because it sounds really scary but i also want to find out really where the second level play is for this so um you know as a person gets to their you know their fifth game their 10th game their 20th game um running asami what are some things that they're going to discover these guys have had those uh that type of experience so let's find out what they discovered we'll be right back so how much are three or four of these episodes worth to you a month third floor wars has a patreon and if you think they're worth a dollar five dollars twenty dollars a month swing by and become a patron We have polls to decide the next episode of the pod, along with early releases of articles and podcasts. Everything we release goes out to everyone, but sometimes our patrons get a head start. The link is in the show notes, or just search for Third Floor Wars on Patreon.com. Thanks for the support. I want to give a quick shout out to our top patrons as of the time of this recording. A big thanks to Nick Westbrook, Colin, Stephen Morris, Kevin Smith, Sam Newman, and Jeremy Peace. We appreciate everybody's support. So, you know, if you listen to this podcast, you know that second level play is something we talk about with all of these deep dives. And, you know, I think we've talked already about how, um, you know, how much you have to keep keep balanced with this master. So, Greg, I mean, uh, what do you consider second level play with Asami? What are what are things that somebody who has gotten in the reps and, and gotten in a ton of games with Asami, what are they going to get good at in order to be successful? Yeah, so so we said this a lot um, on this podcast already, but but I can't, I can't stress it enough is is planning ahead um, because you know we, a lot of us scheming stuff we've talked about. Um, models can't interact on a turn of summon, so if, you, if you're summoning a scheme on it, you've you've got to do them you know summon those guys if you want to drop ski marker in turn five you've got to summon that in turn four mm-hmm. um you know look at tengu right we, we've said how much we love tengu and being able to fly 12 inches and then 
carry self drop ski marker is superb. What's even better is he is being summoned, flying twelve inches to intercept the Dawn Serpent, which you've moved to another spot. Um, so I think a lot of the things you'll um, find, you know, when I play Sammy, and, and I imagine this is true for yourself, Alex, is that halfway through a turn, you know, your opponent might be like, well, why is that guy over there? Why has he moved this here? And then suddenly, you know, at the end of the turn, all the kind of pieces have, have come together. Uh, a bit, you know, a bit like putting a jigsaw together, but by putting the pieces down in what might seem to your opponent a random order, but you're right. constructing a board state yourself. Who her, her movement, her summons, um, the different levels of, of out of activation, um, you know, movement and AP. Um, so that's absolutely massive. Um, there's also a, a huge part um, which ties into kind of uh, what I've been saying is value, um, but a lot of that is also to do with risk. Um, and so we talk about um, Amano Zako's, um, you know, adding a flicker to put hazardous terrain up as not being good value. And that's because, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we've, we've kind of considered this and we're comparing a flicker for hazardous terrain compared with a flicker on the attack or gaining a flicker, um, for her dog bargain trigger to, to, to generate a third AP for a model. And, and so I, well, actually, I've, I've still spent a flicker. I've still gained a flicker. Um, but what have I done with that? Okay. Well, on one hand, yep. I've generated hazardous terrain that hasn't done anything. On the other hand, I've told, Yasunori to take another attack and that's killed, you know, one of my opponent's key models. Well, actually, that flicker meant far more to taking that key opponent's piece or, you know, dropping a bomb for um, plant explosives or a ski marker or something than it would just putting hazardous terrain up, which my opponent may or may not decide to enter. Um, and the risk thing, again, c- comes down to, to that flicker management that, yes, flicker management is important, but I'm kind of trying to, to touch it on as a, as a wider concept in that, you know, do I, if I'm going to spend, you know, go up to th- three flicker for this attack, how sure am I that I'm actually going to do the hit? Because I might want a positive damage to kill the model, but actually if I don't hit them, um, that means nothing. And yep. so then I've got to consider, you know, how many cards does my opponent have? How many cards do I have? And, and all of this other bits and pieces just takes on this extra level. Uh, when you kind of combine it with with managing a Sammy's flicker and a Sammy's wounds, and and you kind of need to, to to get those those reps in that you were talking about, Craig, to figure out actually how this machine works. Um, yeah. You know, Alex and I are, are, are talking about it quite freely because we've been playing you know a lot of a Sammy in the past four or five months. Um, whereas when I first started, I think my first Sammy game was about three hours long because mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out, well, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? Oh, wait a second. I can't put this guy the other side of the wood because then he's not going to be in a Sammy's aura to do damage to her to not take his third flicker point and I want him to stay around. Um, and so, you know, but it, it takes a while to kind of get all of those different um, aspects and all those different considerations you've got to make to kind of keep this um, train moving. Um, and then again, I think that might come back to, to why we have so many big self-sufficient first town models in the crew. Right. It's because at least that, you know, if we say sw- swapped out, um, Dawn Serpent and, um, Yasunori for two Joe Gomu, it's, it's rough, you know, roughly the same cost in, in Soul Stones, but then we've got two other flicker models we've both got to think about. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's something else to manage. Um, I think the final point might be uh, just just to touch on something Alex mentioned um, about Amanjaku following um, Amanozaku around. Um, now, I think a lot of people, myself included, uh, when you first start, it was actually you tend to just keep Amanjaku next to um, Asami because you know Tom stick next to Masters and he's an Oni and she can pass off attacks to him, etc. And the concealment all was really good. And so, you know, you want to use that to protect your master. But actually, there's only really two models in the crew, unless, you, you know, I'm taking a terracotta warrior, that actually do the flicker removal. And so having those two models in the same place actually really restricts what your other models can do. Um, and so you kind of, it seems a little bit counterintuitive um, at times, but actually split those guys up. And then, you know, you've kind of got one kind of good bubble, one bad bubble, if you know what mm-hmm. I mean. One guy's just taking Flicker off, but at least he's, you know, 10, 12 inches away from Asami maybe. Um, and then she's summoning and she's influencing her own part of the board. 
Yeah, I, I got to tell you, Greg, the um, that jigsaw analogy where you're putting down the random pieces, but until that last piece goes down, you don't get to see the picture, I think is a really good one. I mean, it, that's a huge challenge for that Asami player to really, you know, thinking in, you know, a turn or two ahead, let alone it's hard enough thinking activations ahead, let alone turns ahead. But what I would imagine is also great about that is exactly what you um, kind of did the narration on, which is it makes it hard for your opponent to figure out what the hell you're trying to do. Um, and, and then it sounds like they figure it out too late. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> um, unfortunately, luck is, uh, luck is still a factor. So, and then sometimes cars can just go south. Um. <laughs> My sort of second level play um is is all is 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 something something Greg said and something we've been saying a lot, but it's her crew is all about that resource management, um, more so than a, a lot of other crews I've played because you've got you've got the same resources that, that everyone's playing with, you know, AP cards and stones. You've also got flicker and so you so you, and and the Sami's health. So you, yep. you're running on more resource, you're balancing more resources than you would normally be doing maybe in a crew, but then there's there's that other thing, which is that if you're spending flicker to to get positives to attack and damages, you're more you're more likely to go on straight flips for damage. So there's there's more opportunity for cheating cards in for for, for damage, mm-hmm. and, and that's a really that's a really good thing. Obviously, you know, you've got more control over it, but with more options come more potentials for making mistakes. So you can go, like, oh, well, I'm on that straight. Shall I put that eleven in to get the six damage? And it's it's sort of teases you to tempts you to to put that severe in you know when you're on the straight flip when actually maybe you maybe you don't need to so that was something that i was doing when i first started playing asami was um maybe being a little bit i was finding that i wasn't using my cards as effectively as as i'd as i'd like to or as i needed to because there were more opportunity to use them yeah, when you're when you're on a straight flip and you've got that severe in your hand, Alex, it's so hard not to use it, Joker. especially if yeah. the yeah, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so it's that it's that balancing of of of, of cards because they're more easy to use, uh, as well as also need them for summoning. But then yeah, health markers, positioning, flicker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I suppose one one thing you're trying to do actually is you can't apply that force everywhere on the table. You know, like right. it sounds really good. You're like, oh, they can all have focus and they can all have this and they can all be doing that. They can't. They can't all be doing yep. that because then, then they're dead. You know, you've got yep. to apply the force where you need it, which is a, which is a, a, a consideration. Maybe it's a second level play. It's a positive mm-hmm. because you can apply the force where you need it. I need it on that flank. I'll be spending stuff there. I'll push people over there or I need it in now. Next turn, I need it in this other place. You can be applying that force where you need it. But there's more scope for making mistakes there because you can't apply it everywhere. Right. So that, that's my second level play tip, I think, is that resource management and, uh. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing uh, that, yeah, I'd like to add to that as well is, is coming down to those resource managements and, and part of the, the flexibility that we've, we've discussed and we've said how amazing it is and how many options you have. But it's actually to understand what those options are. Mm-hmm. Um, and more than, than almost any other 10 Thunders Masters, that she, she will use her entire keyword of models, um, at one time or another. Now, it might not be every game, um, but you will use them and you, you need to know. And you've, you know, it's been said many times on this podcast, Craig, you know, read your cards, understand yeah. what everything can do. Um, and that's doubly so with Asami because you need, um, because, you know, especially your summons, right? Your summons aren't going to be around long. You, you need to know, understand. And, and what Alex said about applying force, um, it's not just force. It's also, you know, um, dropping scheme markers, how, how you interact with the board. Um, you know, you've got a great toolbox, but you need to understand what tool to take out of it. Um, right. and, and for me, your, your Kai are a great example of this, that, that Alex, um, and I, we, we both just like your Kai. Uh, we both lamented, um, many times about, <laughs> about how far they've fallen. But, but one key thing about your Kai, um, is that they can interact while engaged. Um, now, again, you have to plan ahead, but sometimes that can be really, really useful. Yep. So I may never, you know, I might not summon a yokai in 10, 15 games, but but when I need to do that, I know that I can go to yokai. I know what card I need to summon them. I know, you know, what I need to do. And you can kind of pick that tool out of a draw. Um, now, maybe that there's another way I could do it, but that's going to be, you know, it's like trying to hit a nail in with a wrench. Like, it'll do the job, but a hammer would be better um, mm-hmm. and you could use that wrench for something else. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Um, it's so just great. that, that does take reps. 
It, it does definitely, Greg, and um, and I think those are all, those are all really good callouts. Um, and it brings us back to something that we that I mentioned, which is um, this may not be the best first master for somebody new to the game, um, uh, because. It um, there's a lot going on there, but um, boy, it sounds like there's a lot of value um, once you kind of get put in the work and learn her uh, because it can uh, present to you, um, you know, some really nice opportunities to do what needs to be done when it needs to get done. Um, Greg, one of the things that I'd like to find out from you, though, is what does she hate to see? So when you've got Asami as your leader, you've, you know, you're, you're, you're going into a matchup. What do you hate the opponent to either see or do? What are some counters to this crew? Uh, guns, gun, guns are bad. Yeah. Um, she really doesn't like getting shot. Um, you know, we talked about that resource management. Uh, you know, you could plan your your turn ahead perfectly. If if a Sammy takes, you know, let's say two two to four wounds uh, that you weren't expecting, or, or you know that you hadn't factored into what you were going to do, well, that you know she's only got twelve of them. Um, if you're going to take another couple of wounds to to reduce flicker on something, uh, you know that's she's suddenly at half health, um, mm-hmm. and so that's and and and. Basically, a lot of things just because she has to play so far forward. Even melee pressure um, can, you know, can be a situation she finds herself in quite commonly, um, which is where the uh, the region ten draws comes in. Can sometimes be instead of trying to disengage, just try and whip the enemy model away and then walk off yourself. Yeah, um, and, and and that kind of comes back to you know one of the reasons that, that the crew uh, crews that, that Alex and I tend to play tend to be so fast and have so many aggressive threats in is to kind of saturate um you know give your opponent that threat saturation and say yes you 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 should be putting pressure on my master however you've also got these other things you should be worrying about and if you yep. do put pressure on asami well that's okay i can apply pressure in other ways or you know i can apply pressure on another part of the board so you can't zero right in on 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 my master yeah, I would also imagine, Greg, that uh, anything that's putting uh, hand pressure on you is, is pretty rough, right? Like tons of shock waves or things that are forcing you to discard. Um, I mean, you, the cards in your hand are, are a big resource that you're trying to manage anyway. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's worth mentioning we've we've talked about uh, you know using dark bargain to, to drop scheme markers, using your kaname, um, like it's something that automatically happens, right? You're still flipping cards. Um, yeah. You know, anytime you're flipping cards, you're taking away uh, certainty from from your game plan. Uh, you're taking away consistency from the crew. Um, and so, yeah, as you said, you know, if if you're making me churn through my deck, if you're making me discard from you know discard cards from my hand, my game plan's getting just a little bit weaker, a little bit yeah. weaker. I mean, not not just for some. I mean, it's a generally good good Malifaux rule, right? Like card, yep. card advantage is a big deal. Well, the, the funny thing about it all, too, and I and I and I chuckle about this a lot of times when I see discussions, you know, on on the forums or in, in AWP or, um, you know, when we do these deep dives even um, is theory foe is amazing because when you're just putting stuff through your head and you're looking at cards, you forget that the opponent's playing the game, too. And you, you forget that, um, you know you're going to draw bad hands or you're going to draw a bunch of great hands. And you needed some cards to discard. And you don't want to discard those. So you like, there's so many things that you don't know until you're playing and you've got somebody else trying to beat you. Um, and it's why I preach it all the time, guys is, um, you know, you, you don't know until you faced it. You don't know until you've played it. Um, we and I don't get me wrong. I love theory foe. I really do. I love talking about foe. I like looking at cards and thinking about this, thinking about that. But uh, if you're not putting in the table time, um, you're going to have to qualify your opinion about things. Exactly. Yeah. Especially, um, you know, Malifaux, you know, you're talking plus two hours to get around in so actually kind of getting a table time getting getting those cycles to, to, to build up a decent sample size for any kind of theory you have um, yep. is actually really hard you know you could try something once and be like yep yeah, this works this is superb <laughs> but actually that that could have just been a freak occurrence right yep um you know i, I kind of at this point i want to shout out the the kind of 10 thunders uh, facebook chat group because one of the things i really really like about that chat group is is partially what you're saying Craig. um is that you have almost, 
you know, an infinite amount of fake opponents in there where you said, hey, guys, I think this is good. And loads of people will critique it. And, and, and the critiques yeah. that come back are actually generally really constructive. It's, it's, you know, this is why, this is, you know, why I think it's a good, good idea. This is why I think it's a bad idea. But partially, we, we've recently, I mean, it might have been because we were discussing Asami recently, actually, Alex, but. We did um, a really good comparison. The two of us, um, I think Ray was in there, a couple of the other guys. We did, yeah, we had some really, really good conversations about just more, more general topics. Um, you know, that, that some of the things I talked about tonight, where instead of looking about flipping cars, we talked about, you know, managing resource. We talked about, yeah. um, considering risk. We talked about value and, and we've had some really good discussions about what those, those concepts mean, which, which again, with someone like Asami can actually really help even out that learning curve to just, speak to some other people get like a bit of a hive mind together to, 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 you know, what do I do in situation X? Well, you know, you thinking of something and, and, and testing it out is nowhere near as good as discussing that with, you know, five other people. Exactly. No, could, could not agree more. Alex, is there anything that we need to add on to that? Some things that um, if I'm playing against Asami, I should consider bringing um, to the table. So we, so, so Greg said um, guns, which, which, which is, which is an important point but to go on from that, you know, the entire crew pretty much universally is, um, is a melee crew. So, so it's really predictable uh, when you're the opponent of a of, of an Asami crew. I know it's really flexible, but it's really predictable about how it's going to try and kill your models, which is mainly in in melee. So, so sort of disguised or I don't know, um, the sort of extended reach stuff. Those things are quite quite important. You know, quite good for, for snowing um, armor. Down. Armor can be a big deal. Armor. Well, that's why I often take a samurai, just because armor. Yeah, sorry, is, Alex. I'm just going to jump in and say armor. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Armor sort of really limits you. Um, but think things. Ironically, things that are a little bit similar to the Asami crew are really good against the Asami crew. So the key models, really, that you want to kill, and maybe I'm giving too much away, but um, uh, <laughs> the key, I, don't, I don't mind. The key models that you do want to kill when you're playing against Asami are the Katashiro, the Akanami, and the Tengu, because they're the ones yeah. that are going to they're, they're going to be going out. They're going to be scoring the points, especially the Akanami. Those guys are little bastards. You've got to kill them as quick as possible. Um, but all of them, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, they're, they're all defense four. Um, they're all right. defense four with four or five wounds, so they go down. They do go down. Well, the catcher are literally made of paper, so they go down so quickly. But you have you have to target them when you when you're playing against Sam. You've got to kill those those really quick scheme runners. And the rest of the crew can be quite fragile at times. We thought about maybe putting some pressure on Asami itself because she's taking some wounds herself, so it can shock her. She can heal up, but. It's about yep. when you apply that that pressure to. Her. If you just put a little bit on her, she's probably not going to care because she'll she'll be healing it up. But if you can put a significant amount on her because your opponent overextends and kill her, then that's then that's huge, you know. So kill kill those defense force scheme runners and plan when you're going to put pressure on this army. That's that's my my, my advice. Yeah, yeah. Just just the timing of putting that pressure on her is is yeah, big deal. And again, we're giving away kind of all our secrets here. But yeah. Hey, that's, that's <laughs> it, it, means, it means we'll get better games. Um, you know, you, you feel like you're giving away the candy store, right, Alex? You know, giving away mm-hmm. these tips and talking about these counters, but that's part of the beauty I of like Alpha yeah. is that. Yeah, sometimes even even if the opponent knows <laughs> what to do, that means they still got to yeah. do it. Um, I, I, I it's like not like other games. That. Yeah, I like yeah. it because then they'll yeah. try and do it. And then I get to sort of <laughs> counter that, you know, because then I know that they know what the weaknesses are. And then when they, when they come for it, I'll, I'll be able to respond. So I know that you know that I know that you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, Greg, did you have like, some last thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to just add to what you said there, Craig, um, that, yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, you've got to assume your opponent's fully prepared anyway. Yeah. Um, and so if they are, then you should be able to handle it. If they're not, okay, the game's got a little bit easier for you, superb. Um, and that goes yeah. back to, to, to what I was going to revisit, the, the timing of Hitness Army, is that her healing comes from her activation and maybe activation of another model. So if you wait until after those activations, you know, you can put some wounds on her, they're going to stick until next turn. And then you can go in maybe at the start of the next turn before she's had a chance to get some more wounds back. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, you create a little window for yourself um, to really, really go after her. Yeah. Well, that's that timing of pressure, right? That you talked about. Yeah, exactly. Um, I suppose we kind of got all that a little bit the wrong way around, but hey, people right. figure it out. <laughs> Exactly. Now, um, guys, we're going to take one more break. And when we get back from this break, um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've got two strong 10 Thunders players uh, on the pod today because um, 
when we talk about hot topics, there's been some hot topics around 10 Thunders. Uh, so I'm not going to let this opportunity come by or go by me. So uh, we'll take a quick break and let's talk um, about what other people have been talking about. We'll be right back. Howdy folks, Craig here. Now, if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast. So um, I, I'm hoping to release this episode not too far since we're recording it because um, one on our, on my Patreon, I give the um, patrons an ability to kind of influence the next episodes to come out. And guys, this I told them that this was getting recorded and it um, got voted as they want this as the next episode. <laughs> um, so I have a feeling, you know, sometimes it'll be, it'd be several weeks before I, between recording and putting it out. I don't think that's going to be the case with this one. But um uh, I, I, that being said, I think even if this comes out f- five weeks from now, this will still be relevant. Um, so, you know, 10 Thunders did well at um, at the uh, UK Nationals. Um, and the uh, chant, you know, I think the uh, was a first and third or first and second or some of the podium, you know, soloed Shen Long and the 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 um, the chanting started. Uh, the pitchforks came out and they, you had people saying, is it too much? And then you had people coming in that have never played Shen Long or playing against Shen Long saying, yeah, he's too strong. Do this, this, this and that. Um, you gentlemen have either played Shen Long or have played against Shen Long. Um, so your, your voices, I think, are significant here. So, Alex, um, how many times did you play Shen Long to get fourth at UK Nationals? Yeah, I didn't play Shen Long at all. Um, I don't even own yeah. him. Uh, so I, yep. I played Asami four times. I played McCabe twice and I played Yan Lo once. Um, yeah, and I, and, I, and I came fourth. So, um, <laughs> so Shen, Shen Long is good. Um, the person that came first was was soloing a, a Shenlong list, but, but actually a lot of the list wasn't the monks. Actually, he had a Yasunori, Ivan Minako, and Ivan Toto, so that, and uh, and Kitty as well. So it was quite a hodgepodge sort of mix, maybe taking advantage of of, of some other sort of synergies and situations, uh, and it was just led by led by Shenlong. And I'm not sure about the person that came third. I. I I'm pretty certain they weren't soloing Shen Long. So really, out of, the, out of us three that were in the in, in the top four, we had a, quite a wide variety of, of of masters being being represented. Yeah. Um. And, and I think maybe that just goes to show that you know we've got as ten Thunders players, we've got a lot to be drawing upon. You know, we've mm-hmm. got lots of different masters that are good at different situations, and it doesn't all have to be about about the one. Uh, there was it, it caused quite a lot of. Um, Conversation, I think, did the, the the sort of solo Shenlong winning winning um, nationals, and there's there's been a lot of outcry about how, how broken he is, or um, and so may, maybe he is a bit over the top, you know, maybe he's slightly above the power curve. But I'm, I'm a really big believer that Malifaux, m- most of Malifaux is is about the skill of the player. So yeah, so maybe Shenlong will take two evenly matched players and. and Slightly edge one above the other, um, but actually, you know, we're not we're not really going to get to know that until until we've put the reps in. We were talking about evidence before, you know. If it takes two two hours, two and a half hours for a game, you know, we're talking twenty five hours for ten games. You know, the, yep. the addition's only only been out for you know for a comparatively short amount of time. Maybe we need to maybe we need to get the reps in before we start making like huge claims, you know. And th- there is likely, let's be realistic, there's likely to be imbalance and there's likely to be sort of little things that need tweaking. But maybe we sure. just need to be a bit more rational about it and just a bit more patient about it. I-, I agree, Alex. And, you know, so two masters in 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 Malifaux 2nd Edition. For those of you that are listening that didn't play Malifaux 2nd Edition, there was t- 
really two big moments where we where, where we saw problems, and they were with Sandeep in the Arcanist faction, and they were with uh, Nicodem in the Resurrectionist faction. And uh, there was a lot of talk, uh, and both of those masters, by the way, needed attention. Don't get me wrong, but the talk was, you know, that they're too good, that they're too good. I've at some at some point somebody's got to be good. Um, Someone's at the top got, of the curve, aren't they? Exactly. But the problem with Nikodem and the problem with, oh my God, uh, Sandeep was that they were, they were, they were dominating the faction. So if you, there was a period of time in 2E that if you were a competitive Arcanist player, it was really hard not to bring Sandeep because there was no other masters in key. Uh, there was no keywords back then, but no other masters in in second edition. If you were an Arcanist that could compete with Sandeep, so once he became became the only ch- real good choice in a competitive environment, that's when I thought he became a problem. And eventually, that happened with Nicodem too. Um, and I'm getting the feeling that we j- we have no idea if that's true of Shenlong. Um, and uh, you know, 10 Thunders has a lot of really good masters. I mean, if you listen to the McCabe deep dive, you know how good McCabe is. If you've ever played against McCabe, you know how good he is. I think I'm a big is. proponent uh, of all the 10 Thunders masters that aren't Shenlong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, t- t- I think Alex's call is good. Um, now, Greg, I'd like to get your kind of your hot take on what we just talked about, but you also have done some interesting math with Chi that I think is worth talking about. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's just to kind of finish off uh, the conversation uh, you and Alex were having there, that that yeah, Sh- Sh- Shenlong may, may well be over the curve, um, and and I agree with a lot of you uh, with what you said. I, I think it's also worth mentioning that he exists in the game, and so <laughs> complaining about it doesn't actually take that away. You know, if you go to a tournament, you know, this weekend, then Shenlong's there. All right, well, your your complaining hasn't done anything, um, and I think that when if you immediately say something's broken, you, you kind of stop thinking about it. It's like, yeah, yeah he's broken, whatever. You shut down but, that but, but actually, if you want to be successful competitively, exactly. You, you, he, he, he exists. You've got to be able to cope with him. You've got to think of some interesting strategies maybe to to to, um, to deal with Shen on what he's doing. And, and, and to take it back to your your M2E uh, thoughts there, Greg, uh, regarding Nicodem, um, you know, what, one of the things that, that kind of came out of that was um, I think Jamie Ryan might have been the first guy to do it, actually, which is which is ironic given that he was the uh, the number one Nicodem, um player at the time. But actually, was using Molly and and Malmo in an interesting way to, yep. to drop a lot of punk zombies right in um, Nicodem's face, right? Just just pin him back to the board. So you're so, Molly summoning isn't as good, but you're making a strong positional play, um, you know, which which is something that kind of is very much out of left field. Um, a lot of players started to take suit. Um, so Sue, I think, was actually a book one model, maybe book two um, in in M two E, which you know we're, we're talking four or five years ago at least now. Um, but who actually came right back to the um, the forefront again because he had the ability to just remove uh, course markers without a resist flip um, yeah. targeting an enemy model. So you could target someone like Mortimer who's dropping all his course markers, and he suddenly you know poof off they go. And so, mm-hmm. so that that requires so a lot of you know. Going back to the drawing board. Um, and, and the negative cast aura. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, exactly. And and there's, there's a phrase, I think, from writing, which is called um, murder your darlings, I think, which basically is, is you know, t- taking everything you find precious, everything you, you love, everything normal you do, you know, and saying, actually, right, none of this is working. I need to go back to the drawing board. I need to think of something new. Yeah. And yes, you may change. Yes, you may get eroded. But for the moment, that's not going to help you this weekend. This weekend, you need a plan. Um, wow, Greg, I, I don't know if I could have put it any better. Um, it, 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 that is a really, really good point. And the, uh, you're, you're hundred percent right that as soon as you say, oh, this is, this is broken, this is broken, you, you stop thinking and that doesn't make him disappear. <laughs> so that's a, that's an excellent we did point. It with, we did it with Zareda, didn't we? You know, a c- c- couple yeah. of months ago, you know, Zareda was, 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 was the, the boogeyman, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe Shenlong's more powerful than Zareda, we don't know. But at, at that time, you know, everyone was really struggling with her. And then and then we sort of go, oh, actually, concealment's really good against her because then it, it's that pressure on, on resources again, you yeah. know. Um, you know, t- I, I take two samurai uh, with, with, with trained ninja and put them right up in her <laughs> face because, you know, because shooting's <laughs> really good against her, you know, and, and, yeah. and like, you know, the, so pressure her straight away, you know. And, and people will find their answers, maybe. And, and then, but, but, but if not, 
it, it'll come from it'll come from the reps. It'll it'll, it'll come from the yep. from, from the results. You know, this is this is one. I think I think maybe Swedish Shen, Shen plays really well in, in the Swedish nationals. Maybe I don't know. There, there's probably been a couple of events, but it's not. But is is it dominating yet? Um, right. And and, and 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 if it does dominate, well, well then we'll do something about it. Yep. Yeah, and, and at that point, then you know, Weird does something about it, and hell, I mean, it was Zareda, and then before that, it, it, you know, there was to, all there was talk about is is Lynch. Yeah, um, yeah, that yeah. was a week and a half on yeah. AWP about Lynch is overpowered, <laughs> yeah. and now, now I can't find a Lynch player if I try. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't rate him. I I I try playing him a lot, and I'm he's not my cup of tea at all. Um, yeah, yeah, I find him quite difficult to play. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, this is um, this was this was fantastic, Alex. It was great having you back. And Greg, I I'm going to put you on the spot, man. We got to get you on again. Um, I really enjoyed having you as a guest. Um, uh, guys, for uh, Alex, is there anything anything you want to plug? <laughs> um, just that we all, all our henchmen in the UK they're all amazing. Yeah. You've had two of them on the show, and and they're, they're brilliant. They're doing such a good job at uh, keeping them, you know, uh, just growing the scene. Uh, they're, they're brilliant good dudes how about you greg yeah sure um it's actually um you know i recognize that, that you know we talked a lot about competitive play and um but tournaments are for everyone um and so one of my friends um i'm kieran he three times a year he runs a um, oh, yeah. event called from gotham to samaria um and it's basically it's, it's focused around not not just Malifaux, but actually a lot of different kind of skirmish games it's fucking awesome um, which Malifaux is probably like the most popular um uh, um, <laughs> yeah, basically, it's just a lot of people turning up um, to Element Games in Stockport, um, drinking beers, playing games. There's absolutely no organized play. If anything, that's probably that's the hallmark great. of the event. It's just, oh, hey, you play, you know, if it's a Malifaux's most popular game, um, but, you know, people play, say, Bushido, for example, right? Or yeah. um, Dark Age, and, you know, all these other games I've never heard of. Like, oh, hey, you play this. And, um, there may not be too many of those players uh, in your meta, so you've come here and like, oh yeah, I'm going to play with Stranger, um, and it's just it's almost a complete. It's an opportunity to travel. It's an opportunity to meet players outside of your meta, but without kind of the pressure of a tournament, without yeah, you know, being forced to play three games, whether you want you know, not that you want to or not, but you know what I mean. It's yep. you hang up out all weekend. Uh, the next one is the 17th, 18th, and 19th of January, uh, 2020. Um, there's a Facebook event up if you just search uh, from Gotham to Samaria. Um, you should be able to find it. Um, I'll, I'll put a not, link in the show notes, Greg. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really, really good fun weekend. And and we'll, we'll, we'll both be there. So you can come and have some games of foe against us. That is true. We will both well, be yeah, there. Well, yeah. What they can do is they can bring Shen Long and whoop your asses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's time to start thinking of that Shen Long plan. All right, guys. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that's funny. Um, uh, a real blast, gentlemen. I uh, look forward to talking to you again. And uh, for those of you listening, I appreciate you sticking around. Have a good night. Be sure to check out our shop on thirdfloorwars.com for the latest gaming apparel and gear. While you're there, check out how the USFO Tour is shaping up. How does your conference compare to the others in the United States? Where do you rank nationally? Get those models built, painted, and on the table so we can see you at the U.S. Masters Invitational in October of 2020. Also, rate and write a review on this podcast for us. It really helps us find people almost as cool as you are. Thanks for listening. Howdy, friend. Craig here. Is this episode making you realize you need to buy some models? Gadzooks Gaming is my favorite online retailer because of their large selection, killer prices, and great customer service. Don't you hate buying an entire crew box when you only need one model? Gadzooks sells crew box models individually and saves you a ton of money. They even have free shipping to the U.S. and Canada if you spend $100 or more. Swing by gadzooksgaming.com and make sure you tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. All the details are in the show notes. All right. Who wants to start off with second level play? I don't think anything I do is good. I just play. <laughs> uh, yeah. I I uh, random question. You about to talk about Chi and Shenlong and things. Uh, Shenlong uh, is is that is that some pe- people have been talking about yeah, Shenlong? Everyone's talking about Shenlong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to talk about Shenlong. Um, 
So when we get into the pool here, um, uh, my first question for you guys is, is she just good in everything because of this flexibility? No. <laughs> okay, good, good. So what no, I'll do, no, I'll no, start- yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I guess reckoning so, she blow, right? Yeah. She's um, not, not great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I am sorry. I'm randomly looking for a card very quickly now, so I don't get that wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. Two feet drop. Mark removed. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man. Hey, how it well, it, well, well to, to your credit, Greg, you didn't know we were going to talk about Asami, so that I, you didn't know to get the card out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? So, so professional, man. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of editing, yeah, Greg. I'll make, you sound, I'll make you sound I, I remember, so smart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we tell um, people to read their cards all the time, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure it's too for market, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> 